Welcome to Freedom Church. It is so great to see you this weekend. And my name is Sean Wood. I'm the lead pastor here, in case you haven't met me so far. And I know what you're thinking right now. You're on video. I am. I'm on video. Isn't that cool that I can be on video preaching here? And let me tell you why I am. I am preaching on video right now at Freedom Church so that I can be preaching also live in Savannah, Georgia for Pastor Corey Williams, our great friend who was here just a few weeks ago for his church, Hope City Church, where I get the honor of being an overseer for him. And isn't technology just cool that I can be in Savannah, Georgia preaching and at Freedom Church preaching, and so it is so good to see you. It's, it's still summer at Freedom, isn't it? I mean, you just came inside from the outside where it is so hot, but hasn't summer at Freedom been so exciting? I mean, we had Pastor Chet with us, we had Pastor Hosanna with us, and we were able to have Pastor Corey Williams with us that has talked about, then we had Pastor Andy with us, we had Pastor Josh with us. It has been a great Great summer at Freedom, but I am so glad to be back because I love Freedom Church. I love this church. I love Freedom Church. You know why I love Freedom Church? Because we are that kind of church. Do you know what kind of church I'm talking about? I hope you know what kind of church I'm talking about. We are that kind of church that talks about what we are for more than we talk about what we are against. That's the kind of church we are. We are that church who looks for all that we can agree on, because isn't there so much that we can agree on, rather than always fighting about what we don't agree on. We are that church who believes that the church should be the most inclusive body of people in the whole world because Jesus came to die for you and to save you because he loves you. And so if you are here, we just want to say welcome home. We love you and we love the fact that you trust us at Freedom Church to be the place where you find relationship with God. We are the church, that kind of church, that does not take ourselves very seriously. If you were here back in June, we did one of our favorite series called Playlist, and you found out we don't take ourselves very seriously, but we take Jesus very seriously. We are that church. We are that church that takes it too far, pushes the limits, tries new things, like watching your pastor on video while he's preaching in another city, in another state, at the same exact time. We will try anything short of sin to be able to reach as many people as we possibly can with the life-giving, hope-filled message that is that Jesus loves you and there is a hope for you. We are that church. We are that church that is relentlessly committed to excellence because we know that excellence honors God. We are that church that believes it should be on earth as it is in heaven. And because of that, we're not a white church. We're not a black church. We're not even a tan church. I know y'all going out there getting tan this summer, but we're not even a tan church. We're not a Republican church. We're not a Democrat church. We are a Jesus church. Let me say it this way. We aren't eyes or legs. That's for my 20 and under crowd. Let me say it differently for my 30 and over crowd. For my over 30 crowd is we are not Edward or Jacob. I don't even really know what that means. My daughter said that you'd get it, all right? So we're not Edward or Jacob. We are that church. So here is the plan for this week and for the next few weeks, actually. You are involved in a huge, huge part of what's going to happen at Freedom Church over the next few weeks. We've been announcing for a few weeks now that on August 21st, we are going to celebrate our 11th anniversary, and that's actually our exact 11th anniversary as a church. And it's our 11th time to be able to celebrate what God is doing through you, what he's done in you, and how he's changing this community because of Freedom Church. But also, we love to celebrate our anniversary because it's an opportunity to be the very first day of freedom for a lot of people when they find freedom in Christ. And so we've been encouraging you to not just invite 
but bring somebody to church with you on August 21st. I want you to bring as many people as you can to church on August 21st. In fact, we're having a good old-fashioned bring a friend to church day. If you grew up in church, you may remember those bring a friend to church days. Well, we're having them. Back in kids, they're bringing a friend to church. You're going to bring friends to church, and we are going to see God change people's lives in amazing ways. And so today, what I wanted us to do is look at why is that so important to us? Why would we have a bring the friend to church day? Why would we say bring so many people because we're going to tell the life-giving, hope-filled message of Jesus Christ and how he can change people's lives? Why is it that we are that kind of church? The kind of church that says there are people that are far from God, but they're close to you, and they can too find freedom in Christ. And so I want to take just a few weeks before August 21st to ask this important question. Why we church? Why do we church? And yes, I am using church as a verb. Why do we church? The way that we church, the verb behind what we do. Why do we do church the way we do? And the way we church has a why. It really does. Because everything that we do, we do for a reason. It is connected back to the why behind why we do everything we do. There is a why for every decision we make. Now, that doesn't mean we always make the right decisions, but we try new things. We, we try to be innovative. We try to reach more people. Why? Because there is a why connected to it. In fact, if you are going to be an inspiring church, which is the type of church we want to be, if you're going to be an inclusive church which says, hey, God loves you despite the sin that you're involved in because he can change you and he can change your life. If we're going to be a fun church, why? Because we think that people who have been set free should have the most fun of anybody in the world. And if we are going to be a free church, realizing that we are under grace and we have freedom in Christ because of what he has done for us, there are just some decisions that we're going to have to make as a church in how we do church, how we church. So, so we're asking, why do we church the way that we do? So, so what we preach, what I do on the weekends, and my friends and our other pastors here get to come in, and we get to preach the Word of God. We get to teach you and preach to you about who God is and what He's doing in the earth. The way that we preach is driven by this why. I want to talk to you this weekend about a why that drives everything we do, including the way we preach. What we don't preach is driven by this why. How we worship and how we don't worship is driven by this why. How we carry out discipleship and, and community and grow people in their faith and see you become who God has created you to be is driven by the why. How we give and serve of our time, our talent, our treasure. Pastor Josh talked about how serving is an ethos of who we are as a church. And how we do that is driven by the fact of the why we church. Why do we do church the way we do? Why we church the way we church? Church as a verb. Now, we don't do church I'm talking about we don't just show up, go through the motions, and, and just make it about what we do. There's a strategic way as to why we are carrying out the decisions that we carry out because there is an ultimate type of church and who we want to be that is modeled after who Jesus was. Church is a verb, says there is a strategic and important reason that we do what we do. So here, here's really the underlying question that we all should have if we're going to be a part of a church. Why do we present the gospel the way that we do as a church? Now, remember, gospel is a word that just means good news. And the good news is that Jesus died for our sins so that we don't have to. And that he rose from the grave defeating death because we couldn't. And he did all of this for you so that he could save you. And a lot of you have allowed Jesus to save you. And that is receiving the gospel and saying, I received the good news about me. But why do we then present that gospel, the good news, the way 
that we do. Another way is asking the question, is why do we tell the good news in such a life-giving way? Why, why are we so life-giving with what we do? Why are we always talking about the hope? Why are we always talking about grace? Why do we present the gospel the way do we do? Why do we talk more about the hope that there is in Christ than we do about hell? Because we do, right? Why do we do that? Why, why don't you preach, Pastor, all the specific sins and call them out? And of course, you know, just the sin that I don't do, Pastor. But why don't we call those sins out rather than just telling people what it could look like to live under the unbelievable authority of the Jesus way? You know, we talk about that all the time, the Jesus way. And we don't talk a lot about specific sins because we believe a specific Savior came to save you and he can change everything about you. Why do we do that? Why do you talk about the freedom that comes from a relationship with Jesus instead of maybe instilling fear in people about what it could be like if they didn't have God? Why do you talk about the freedom that there is with God rather than the fear of what would it be like without God? Now, there's an easy answer to all of these. I don't always have easy answers, but this one has an easy answer. What is it? Because Jesus did it this way. Jesus was life-giving. Jesus was hope-filled. Jesus was all about showing people what he had come to do, not about what they were doing, but what he had come to do. When Jesus spoke, in fact, about hell, for example, it was always to religious people, and he always spoke more about the way to get out of hell and the way to spend eternity with God, the kingdom of heaven he would talk about, than he ever talked about hell. When Jesus spoke to people far from God, he had the most life-giving sermons the world has ever seen. He always stepped in with hope. He always stepped in with the answer. Not the problem, but the answer. And we want to be like Jesus. For example, in, in the scriptures in John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11, Jesus is confronted by the religious people. Because they catch a woman who is in the act of adultery. Look at John chapter 8, verse 3 through 11 with me. It says, as he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus who had been caught in the act of adultery. And they put her in front of the crowd. Now, I want you just to feel what's going on for a moment, because I want you to imagine with me, she's been caught in the act of adultery. Literally, they probably just threw some fabric on top of her, a towel or something that was in there, a blanket, and they just drug her out into the streets. And it says they took her in front of the crowd. They wanted to humiliate her. They wanted to embarrass her. They wanted to point out her specific sins. They wanted to say, do you see what this woman did, Jesus? And they brought her in front of the crowd, and they said, teacher, they said to Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses, the old way, not the Jesus way, but the law way, says to stone her. What do you say? They say to Jesus. When they were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. So they didn't even care about this woman. They probably didn't even know her name. They didn't know who she was. They didn't know her story. They were just using her as an opportunity to point out her sin to try and trap Jesus because they wanted to use it against him. But Jesus, he stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. So, so just imagine with me. Jesus is there and he, he stoops down and he begins to write something in the sand. Now, we don't know what he wrote, but what we do know is the reaction that the people had, the reaction that the religious crowd, that was there demanding of Jesus, like, hey, you need to do something about this. You need to answer our questions. In fact, in verse 7, it says, they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again, and he wrote in the dust again. And so he says, hey, whoever, whoever, you know, hasn't sinned, why don't you cast the first stone? And he's writing something in the dust. Again, I don't know what he wrote, but I think I do. I, I think he was like, hey, Obadiah, look here. 
And he, what, what, did you think his name was going to be Cody or something? I mean, he's back in Bible time. So he's like, he's like, Obadiah, Obadiah, look here. He writes something in the sand. And then I think he looks at Obadiah with a look of like, hey, you, you, you got no sin? Because I've written a few things here that might remind you of who you've been. And then he's to the next one. He's like, hey, John, there seems to be a lot of Johns in the Bible, so we'll go with John. John, you, 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 gotta, you see this? You see this? You can just imagine Jesus just playing with them just a little bit of like, hey, you've, you've drugged this woman out in front of me to embarrass her? What? How about this? Do you remember this one? Uh, March, you know, March of uh, 23? Here, let's talk about that. What, what was happening on that day for you? Obadiah, what was going on there? And he's writing all of this stuff in the sand. And they, they're demanding an answer. And then he, he does it again. He starts to write again. And he stooped down and he wrote in the dust again. And when the accusers heard this, so they heard Jesus saying, hey, those of you who don't have never sin, why, why don't you cast the first stone? Whoever, whoever, whoever wants to step up, come on, you can do it. They slipped away one by one Beginning with the oldest. I find that interesting because I believe the oldest probably had the most sin baggage that he was carrying around, and he was the first to leave. The younger ones who maybe were still trying to convince themselves that they didn't have anything to be you know, ashamed of, that they didn't have anything that they would be written down, they were the last to go. It says, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Let me show you something that I love about Jesus. He's right there in the middle of the mess. And that's where the church is supposed to be. We are that church that will be right in the middle of the mess. And then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? What a life-giving message. Hey, where are all the bullies? Where'd they go? Where are all the people that were ready to cast a stone at you to kill you? Where are all of those that were using you just as a prop to be able to make a point to mess with me? Where are they now? Where are your accusers, Jesus said? Didn't even one of them condemn you, he says? I mean, isn't there even one of them who has condemned you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Jesus says, look, there's no condemnation for you today. All I have for you today, Jesus says, no condemnation. I have compassion. I, I know what you've been through. I know there's a story that you have for your life. And this is what this church wants to be to so many people. Someone who can say, hey, we don't have any condemnation for you because we've been through it too. We know you have a story because we have a story too. Here's what we have for you. We have compassion for you in your pain. We, we, we're not going to use you as a, just a prop to be able to prove how much better we are than you. No, we're going to be co-laborers right beside you saying, we've been through that as well. And see, what I, what I find interesting about this story, and I think it's a, it's a lesson to the church and what the church is supposed to be, is that the people, the religious people, who said that they loved God fiercely. The, the religious people who said that they were the best at loving God didn't love people. And here's what I can tell you as a lesson to the church, is that it's impossible to say you love God but not love people. It's impossible to say that you worship God, but you don't have any compassion for people. It's impossible to say, oh, oh, I love church, and I love learning more stuff, and I love getting knowledge, but I just don't love sinners. Because Jesus showed the religious people of that day, and he's showing us, too, how to be that kind of church, that he loved people. It was compassion. It was life-giving. No mention of hell, just a hand of help saying, hey, there's no anybody here to accuse you. There's no one here to condemn you, and I don't either. But go and sin no more. What is that? That's saying, hey, I believe more about you, better things about you. I believe in you even more about yourself than you do. 
And Jesus says that to you and I too. He says, hey, I know what you can do because I created you. He says that about your friends who are far from God, but they're close to you. I know what they can do because I created them. He says, that's the kind of church that I'm rising up. That's the kind of church I want Freedom Church to be in 2022, reaching Berkeley County with hope-filled, grace-filled compassion. See, when Jesus needed to talk about specific sins, when Jesus needed to talk about specific challenge, he didn't do it in the middle of a crowd. He didn't bring people out to embarrass them. He did it in the midst of relationship. He did it hard conversations. He had those in small groups where he brought his disciples together and he asked them tough questions and he challenged them in tough ways. But he did that through relationship. That's why we love small groups so much here. So when it gets to hard conversations, when we need to point out specific sins and say, hey, you're better than that. When we need to say, you don't look good in biker shorts, bro. When we need to say that, we do that in the context of relationship. We do that in small groups. And I just want to challenge you. The season is coming up where small groups are getting ready to kick off. And I want you to get in a small group. And I want you to be in those type of relationships where you build community and you have someone who can help you along the way. But he never embarrassed people. He never drugged them out in front and pointed out their sin. Also, we know scientifically people don't respond to guilt and shame. In fact, when you just guilt people and shame people, they are paralyzed and they usually don't make any changes at all. People are not motivated by how bad they are. They're motivated by how good God is. They're not motivated by their sin. They're motivated by a Savior. They're not motivated by fear. They're motivated by just hopefully having faith in something bigger than themselves. It's what motivated you to change your life is the fact that Jesus said there's something better for you. Holy Spirit convicted you that he had something more for you, more than you could ever ask for or imagine. And that's the kind of church we are. We want to bring that message to people. Jesus loved people and wanted to see them saved and changed. And don't forget this. Remember we talked about it earlier. Gospel means good news. Can you say that with me? Say, good news. News, good news, not not bad news. The, The gospel is good news. So can I say something that, again, I feel like it maybe is a little bit elementary, but I think we forget it sometimes. I even forget it myself. Good news should make you feel good. That's what good news makes you feel like. How do you feel when you get other good news? How do you feel when you when you got the job? How did you feel? How did you feel when you've been trying for so long to get pregnant and you finally found out you were pregnant? How did you feel? You felt so great. How did you feel when you, your team won the championship? How did you feel when you got good news? You felt good. And so every time you walk into the church, the body of good news, the body of Christ, the body of those who are bringing the good news to the world, we should feel good because even in our sin, we find out we are forgiven. Even in our sin and our addictions, we find out we can change. Even in the places where we have been so broken, we find out that God can put us back together like nobody else can because he made us. And that is good news. That is smile invoking, I can't believe it's not butter kind of good news. That's the kind of good news that makes you want to scream from the toppest mountain, the Bible says, the tallest mountain, that there is some good news for the world. And that is the kind of church we want to be. The kind of church that Jesus was to this woman that right in the middle of the mess. So here's the thing. If we have good news, the the second question that I kind of like to bring up is that maybe you might would ask yourself about our church is, it feels like we are hyper-focused on people far from God, on lost people. It It feels like that rather than just always getting together and maybe kind of gaining more knowledge ourselves or getting deeper and better, being better Christians, that a lot of what we do is that we focus on bringing people who are far from God 
but close to us into the experience so that they could find freedom in Christ. That doesn't mean that we don't help us to grow. We think better Christians do a better job at reaching people and reaching the lost. We think that better Christians are better for this world. We think as we grow and develop that that is something we want for you. In fact, we want you to grow. We want you to be deeper in your relationship with God. But you might say, but it feels like we are hyper-focused on lost people. And I gave a lot of thought to this question because I wanted to really give it to you in a way that, you know, you could understand. I want to be succinct with it, but I want to give you enough information. And so I thought long and hard, why, why does it feel like we are hyper-focused on people who are far from God rather than just really hyper-focused on ourselves? Why does it feel that way, Pastor? And, and here's what I would say. Because we are. Because we are. Now, that doesn't mean that this church isn't for you if you have allowed Jesus to save you. Because so, so we are for your growth. We are for you. We want to see you grow. We want to see you grow as a believer. And in fact, on September the 11th, can I just give you a little sneak peek about something that's going to happen? On September 11th, we are starting a sermon series and a small group alignment series. That means that all of the small groups of Freedom Church are going to come together and study the same exact thing. I'll be preaching it on the weekends. We'll be studying in our small groups. It is going to be incredible what we are going to be able to do as a church. And I am so excited about this because what we're going to learn about is how to be emotionally and spiritually healthy as people. And if there's one thing we've learned over the past couple of years is how there are places and parts of our life where we are not emotionally or spiritually healthy. And this series is going to help you grow in that. And we believe that if we can take you not just for months, not just for years, but for decades as a part of this church, and we can develop you emotionally and spiritually in to healthy people, that it's better for everybody. It's better for everybody. So we want to see you grow. So what that means is, this church is for you. Everybody say for. This church is for you. It's just not about you. Do you see the difference? Some of the best things in life are for you, but if you make them about you, Oh, man, you can ruin them. Let's start with an easy one, marriage. It's for you. It disciples you. It develops you. It brings great joy to our lives to have someone that we are married to for a lifetime and to get to spend good days, bad days, ups and downs, mountains and valleys. It, it's great. It's for you. It makes me better to be married to my unbelievable wife. But if I make it about me, oh, it doesn't go good. Anybody got a testimony that they could share on that? It does not go well when you make it about you. How about parenting? I, I mean, there's so many times I'm tempting to, tempted to make parenting about me, my wants, my desires, my needs. And what I know is that God gave me these amazing four children to be able to develop them into men and women who love Jesus and live their life the Jesus way. And in order to do that, I can't make it about me. Because if it's about me, it doesn't serve them. So it's for me, though, because I can't wait to see them grow up. I can't wait to see them have children. I can't wait to see them follow Jesus. I can't wait to see them serve Jesus. And even getting to see them do it now is one of the great pleasures of my life. But if I make it about me, it can no longer be for me. In fact, I would say that. If I make something about me, it no longer is for me. Because it'll never give me what I need. It's that way in your job. I mean, if you make your job about you, it won't be for you. You can't be selfish with your coworkers. You can't be selfish in your job. It's for you, but it's not about you. And this church is for you, those of you who have allowed Jesus to save you. This church is for you if you want to grow in your faith. This church is for you if you want to become spiritually and emotionally healthy as a human being, as a spouse, as a parent, as a friend. This church is for you, but it's not about you. In fact, the very fact that it isn't about you is why we have a mission from God to reach people who are far from him, but they are close to us because that makes it for us. 
but it's not about us. And what does that mean? That means that some of your preferences for what you would want out of a church, what you would want out of an experience, what you would want out of a small group may not be met. It might even mean things like this. Watching your pastor on video every now and then. It's not everybody's preference, right? But it's for you. I guarantee you the word of God can speak to you through this when it's not about you. But if you make it about you, then Jesus cannot be the primary, unbelievable core of this church. And if Jesus is the core of this church, then we have to see that we live like him. So why are we this way? Hyper-focused on lost people? Because Jesus was. That look at Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man, that was a name that Jesus had for himself, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. And we really do believe that it is possible to spend an eternity with God. And we really do believe that it is possible not only to spend eternity with him, but to have an abundant life here on earth because of him. And because of that, we really do believe that it's possible to make choices in your life where you can spend an eternity far away from God. And it's possible to not have abundant life because you don't choose the Jesus way. And so it matters what we do. It matters that we as a church decide we got to keep growing. It matters that we have a list of people, we'll talk about those in just a moment, that we identify in our lives that are far from God but close to us and we take them on as our responsibility. It matters that we're not always just concerned about us, our preferences, our wants, and us getting deeper in our faith. See, the deepest place that Jesus could have ever been The most satisfying place that Jesus could have ever been would have been at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But yet he chose to leave heaven and come to earth, to live as a man, to die on a cross so that your sins and my sins would be paid for. See, I think think deeper what a lot of people mean, and and maybe you don't mean this, but I think a lot of people mean this. I want to go deeper in my faith. I, I got to go deeper. They really just mean I want to learn some new theological truth that's really cool, and I've never seen it that way, and I've never heard it that way, and I just want to learn that, and, and I want to learn something new and challenging all the time. And what they don't face the facts of is that there's so much that we already know that we're not doing. There's so much in your faith right now you already know that God is calling you to work on being a better spouse. You already know how it should look like for you to treat your spouse. You already know what it looks like to be the best parent you could be. You know there's a goal out there, but that's hard work. So so give me something deep and interesting and something I can say I never heard before, Pastor. Don't tell me again how I'm supposed to forgive the people that I don't want to forgive. That's not, that's, that's old news. I want something new, something interesting. Go deeper, Pastor. Just quit preaching every time about how I'm supposed to be kind and love people, even though Jesus said, love God, love people. If you'll do those two things and just keep working on those, you'll grow into the perfect version of who he wants you to be. No, I don't want to love people. There are some people that are so hard to love, Jesus. Don't make me do that. Give me something deeper. Challenge me. Challenge my mind. And Jesus is saying, will you get in the middle of the mess with people? But will you work on what I've already told you to do? In fact, the only command that Jesus ever gave, in fact, when he was leaving this earth, it was the last command that he gave right when he was leaving. The command that he gave was to go and make disciples, not to sit and study more about being a disciple. And so it's action-oriented, and we want to be action-oriented as a church. And that's going to mean we're going to grow because healthy things grow. In fact, if you took your you know, child who has not hit puberty yet or hasn't finished growing yet, and you took them to the doctor, and the doctor year after year said, hey, they're not growing, there would be concern. They would start asking questions. Why aren't they growing? What's not happening? Because healthy 
things grow. Every healthy organization grows. Every healthy business grows. And healthy churches grow too. And so here's the thing. If, if you think smaller is better when it comes to church, oh man, this church is going to get on your nerves. Because we will constantly be telling you, invite people who are far from God but close to you so they can find freedom in Christ. And we won't stop until every single person in Berkeley County who does not know Jesus right now is sitting in some church in Berkeley County learning about Jesus. And can I say this? It is all the churches of Berkeley County that need to grow. We pray for the churches of Berkeley County that they will grow. I pray for my friends over at Point North. I pray for my friends over at Northwood. We pray for our friends at Faith. We pray for our friends at Seacoast. We're praying, God, fill these life-giving churches so that more people will know about you. And until everybody in Berkeley County says, I know Jesus, and I'm following him, and they're sitting in some church, we aren't going to stop growing. And that's what I want you to know is we are that kind of church. We're the kind of church that says, hey, there's still somebody out there who's far from God, but they're close to one of us. And so we are going to make sure that we tell them. In fact, can I challenge you on something? If you think that smaller is better, pastor, aren't we big enough? I mean, have you seen the parking lot? We we, we get to do two experiences right now. I mean, do you really want to do three experiences, four experiences again, pastor? Do you want to keep growing? See, I think that's something we lost during COVID a little bit. Is people don't, didn't know what to do about inviting people. People started going to church less and less. A lot of you come less now than you did before. And because we don't have the vision anymore. We don't understand that every time we come, we bring somebody. We don't understand that every time we come, we serve somebody. Every time we come, we love somebody. And so here's what I want to challenge you with. If you think we're big enough, I mean, we just expanded the building. Aren't we big enough, Pastor? I mean, if we fill this up four times, aren't we big enough, Pastor? I just want to ask you, who are you willing to tell to go to hell? Think about it. Well, we're big enough, Pastor. We don't need to grow anymore. Who are you willing to tell that they can spend an eternity away from God? See, I don't want anybody in Berkeley County under our watch to ever have that on their plate. So healthy things grow. And, and so that's our view on the gospel. That's why we present the gospel the way that we do. And and I hope it makes you want to bring a dozen people, not three people, but a dozen people on August 21st. And that we will celebrate together when we see them have new life in Christ right before our eyes. But how does this all come together for our church? See, so we said it earlier, we call the people far from God but close to you and ID3. That means we identify three people who are close to you but they're far from God, and then you invest in them, you invite them, you bring them, and that you have the responsibility of making sure that they are a part of the Jesus way and learning about Jesus. In fact, right now, our ushers are going to begin passing out some cards. I want each of you to take three cards. Everybody say, three cards, three cards cards. I want you to take three cards, and let me just tell you, this is not the time to end. Uh, it is not a time to leave. I'm not, I'm not even almost done yet. we got a f- lot more to cover here, so don't leave yet. In fact, um, ushers, while you're passing out the cards, a couple of you just go lock the doors. Just lock. I'm just joking. We won't lock the doors, but they will stand there menacingly looking at you, okay? Do not leave yet. Take three cards. I want you to take these three cards, and, and I want you to hold these cards for just a moment. And there are stations all over the auditorium. And here's what I want you to do with these cards. I want you to prayerfully, as our worship team is coming now, and they begin to lead us through a song, I I want you to prayerfully go to one of these stations where there are Sharpies spread out all through, and I want you to write first names on each of these cards. One first name on each card. You'll have three ID3s by the end of this moment together. And I want you to take a moment, just you can sit in your seats for just a moment, you can worship for a little bit, but then I want you to go to those stations and fill out those cards, and then we're gonna use them in just a moment. So as we worship together, just for a moment, one song, I want everybody to leave your seat, I want everybody participating in this, everybody take three cards that the ushers have given you, and just go and put three names on there there will be three names that we will be able to see life change in them. They're your ID3s. Let's do that together.
All right. Well, if you will move back to your seats, and I thank you guys so much for participating in that. I thank you for the names that you have put down on there. So now what I want to do is we're going to take this to the next level. What I want to do is the most important part of this process together as a church. I want us to ask Holy Spirit to go ahead of you and to him to make the invitation, an impartation of the invitation on your behalf for the people that you have put down their first names on this card. And so every weekend during our experiences, you know that we pray together and out loud together. We're teaching you to pray publicly because we believe that the power of prayer changes things. And so what we're going to do is pray for these specific people that you have listed on there. And I love to pray, and I love to pray with the whole church like we get to do every weekend because Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Matthew 21, 22 says, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. And Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. There is power in our corporate prayer, which is why we pray together every single weekend out loud and together because prayer is powerful and publicly praying together brings Holy Spirit into this with us and that's what we want to do. So we're going to pray together out loud and together right now for those three names that you have written down on those cards. First, I want you to pray for each name that's on the card and the pain that they may be experiencing, the pain that you can see, and the pain that you can't see. So just pray out loud for those names that are on your card. God, we pray right now for these names. I pray for each person that is written on these cards. I pray for them as their names are being called out now. I pray that you would be going ahead of us, that you would be making them understand their need for a savior that they would be primed and we pray for their pain we pray for what they've gone through we pray for god the fact that you know their stories you're in the middle of their mess so god let us be in the middle of the mess with them we pray that in jesus name second i want us to pray for the opportunity that we will have to invite them in fact, you'll see on your cards that there's a little check mark for each day that you're going to continue to pray for them. And I want you to pray every single day for these names. And we're going to start that now by praying for them right here out loud and together. But I want you to specifically pray for the opportunity that you would have the opportunity, that God would open up the opportunity for you to invite them to August 21st. So God, we do. We pray right now for each of these individuals. And we pray that God, there would be lunches that would be made. There would be times that we run into them that we wouldn't even realize was going to happen, that God, you would go in front of us, you would go before us, and that you're preparing the way. God, we know that you have divine appointments already ready for us to make these invitations. So God, would you do that in Jesus' name? Amen. And then third, you wrote their names down because they are close to you. You love them. You know the pain that they're going through, but you also know that they are far from God. And so I want to pray right now for their salvation, that they would hear the good news, they would receive the good news, and they would know that the good news is for them. And on August 21st, I'm praying for each of these names that they would allow Jesus to save them and maybe even take their next step in baptism. So let's pray for that right now. God, we thank you that, God, you would allow us to be a part of their story. God, we're asking you that they would hear without any hurdles, that they would hear without any distractions, that they would hear despite past hurt and despite past disappointments, that they would hear the good news and that, God, it would give them faith and it would give them hope and that they would know that they can be changed because of you, Jesus. And so, God, would you allow us to be a part of that story as we pray for them every day? In Jesus' name, amen. So this week, I want you to use your cards. Take them with you, and I want you to use them as a reminder. M make a check mark every time you pray for them. And then no matter when that is along the process, whether you, the first day you pray for them, you get to invite them. When you invite them, on the back of your card, there is an invite. And so here's what I want you to do. 
I want you to go to that person and say, hey, I've been praying with you. In fact, I've checked it off here. I prayed for you for four days in a row, seven days in a row, maybe 13 days in a row. I prayed for you, and I've been asking that you would come to August 21st. And so I wanted to give you this invite to our church on August 21st, Freedom Church. And I just want you to come and celebrate our anniversary. And it's going to be a lot of fun. I think you'll love our church. And I've been praying for you. And I want you to know that. And so it gives you a great opportunity to hand them an invite. Show them that not only do we love them as a church, but you love them. And nobody is mad about getting prayed for. So let them know you've been praying for them. And then do that faithfully every single day. Pray for them and ask God to do a mighty work in their lives. We are that church. This church is for you, but it's not about you. And if we live like Jesus, seeking and going after the lost, we will be a church that makes a difference and we will grow. That's the kind of church we want to be. Our worship team is going to come now and they're going to take us into a time of response. Maybe you'll continue to pray for those cards as well. And I can't wait to see you next week. I'll be here in person next week, not on video, and I will continue this series, Why We Church. Let's respond together now in worship.